Um, hey guys, uh, I'm Hungrybox. I wanted to talk for a little second about the, I guess the premise of what we call top player privilege in the community. Um, basically it's a notion that embodies the idea that like players who are really good or who place really well, players with really good results in the past, players that are, you know, considered to be the best, they get special privileges or, you know, special accommodations given to them at tournaments. And basically, you know, it, um, they get things that other players in tournaments don't necessarily receive, even though they're all, you know, I guess paying the same entrance fee and they all, you know, still have, when the tournament starts, they're still all in the same, you know, position in the bracket and all that. Um, I guess one one of the one of the big outcries that was recent was the fact that in Genesis three the staff was originally considering um, floating on a lot of the top seeded players for Smash Four um, to a later bracket. I believe that was Genesis three, and uh, I, they ended up not doing that um, because of a huge outcry on behalf of the other players. Now. Uh, you know, it was a good move for them, for them to not do that, basically because um, that would have resulted um, in perhaps a bracket which was not seated properly. Not necessarily because floating on good players is a terrible idea, because the game wasn't out nearly that long yet. Um, it wasn't like Melee, where you could, you know, have definitely enough, you know, results and, and data on the board to to um, understand which players were the most likely to advance. And if you look at the results for Genesis 3 and Melee, the results were, you know, um, as far as anyone could tell, pretty pretty expected. Um, it's all, it's always difficult to predict who's going to be like the other two or three spots in the top eight, apart from the big six as it currently goes. Um, but there's always upsets, so there's there's never there's never a clear contest way to do it, which everyone understands. But the top 32 placing players you know, if you ask someone, if you were given someone a list of all the players attending and you wanted to ask them in melee, okay, who are the top, you know, 24 of these 32 players in the bracket? I guarantee you most people would name at least 20 of them correctly who actually make it into the bracket simply because the players who are that good have this consistency about them that pretty much assures they're going to make it at least in the top 32. But that's a whole another topic. Um... So what I was saying is like top player privilege. There's a thing in the Smash Bros. community, and there's a good way to describe it. I think it's pronounced as a meritocracy or meritocracy, and you know, meritocracy basically says that the people who accomplish more, who have done more, um, the definition of that is that they have more power. I don't think there's a power struggle necessarily between players in the Smash community. We're not about power or conquering land. You know, it's more about having a voice and being able to speak out as to what's important. You know, if, if uh, you know, me or Leffen or Mango or Mitsuki or whoever, if, this, if they make a post on social media or on, you know, r slash Smash Bros or on Twitter or something like that, when they make a post, it gets retweeted heavily or it gets shared heavily or it gets responded to heavily because of the following that they have top players because of their actions, because of all, all the screen time they've had, because of the amount of people that they've inspired, or basically the amount of fans that aspire to be them, um, they have that large following and they have that large response and that large audience of people who are, you know, willing to hear what they have to say. And it's not because they were chosen at random, like, okay, you will be a top player and you will be a top player at random from like birth. It, you know, it's not like that. We all understand that Smash Bros. is a very difficult game, and a lot of work is uh, necessary to get to that level. And a lot of people who put in the work don't reach that level, but sometimes certain players do. Now, whether or not that's a factor of luck, or being in the right place at the right time, or having the right people to play, you know, that's, that's all Smash theory. That's up for debate for a very long time. But in terms of understanding why, why work ethic is important in the Smash community is that apart from the game, there's also a lot of outside aspects of Smash. There's you know guys like Samox making these amazing documentaries. 
there's all the TOs, there's all the commentators, there's all the people behind the scenes working at Twitch, for instance, who make Smash a living, breathing esport that we have nowadays. Um, so work ethic is extremely important. Um, so work ethic is important. If you're running an event, obviously you have, you know, you have things you're reserved to, you have the right to do things, you can call the shots and all that. Of course, that's not even a question. I guess the question more leans towards, all right, why is it that, you know, we love these top players, we love these really talented players, but how come, you know, how come they can do certain things that we can't? And it's not so much that the top players feel like a needs like, oh, we're so high and mighty, we're gonna go ahead and do these things. We want this TV to ourselves so we can practice. Or, you know, we want to stay in the venue next couple of hours. We want to get here early to play more. Or, you know, we we want to ask TOs to hold a match for us. You know, and that's one of the big examples is sort of I maybe mean, asking them getting like the advantage of, okay, we'll let you be a little bit late because, you know, you're a top player. Like, if Mango comes late to an event, if Mango says he's going to be 20 minutes late to his match and... Um, you know, it's a it's it's a, like a round one match, for instance. It's it's difficult to imagine in a, in a like a imagine like Genesis three if Mango had been twenty minutes late to his match. I mean, nothing nothing from his fault. Like if there was traffic or something like that, you know. Smash has gone to the point now where TOs are very strict, which is a good thing. Well, um, you know, if if you're late or if you you know are not there on time, you will get DQ'd because of how massive the event is and has to run well on time. So. The reason that, you know, Smoke Goombas all day would be eliminated, but Mango wouldn't be, is mainly because in Smash, especially nowadays, I suppose that audience participation and storylines and legacies serve to build the game. And it comes to the fact that the top players create these stories. They're sort of like... The heroes, I'm not talking about me because I'm rarely that, but, you know, players that, you know, really drive forward the, the narrative of comp competitive play, at least in Melee, you know, Ar Armada, Mango, Leffen, you know, they're the ones that if they don't appear in the top eight or the finals of an event, the, it's like the, the stature of the event loses a lot of its footing, you know, all the build up, all the anticipation that this huge audience really, really wanted to take advantage of is now sort of gone. And, you know, because of that, people want to make sure that they at least have a chance for that to happen. Because all this money and time is being put into preparing this, you know, scale, this event of epic proportions. And we want to please the most people, or, you know, the TOs want to please the most people. And sometimes that involves, you know, cutting a string to or here. Nothing with cheating, obviously not like that, but making accommodations so that the players, the people that most people want to see, you know, have the ability to perform to their best. And I think it's nothing more complicated than that. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's just Smash Bros. does that. I think anything that's competitive, you know, most things are meritocracies. Like, why do, why do players get respect where this, like, it's like this respect, this idea of respect that, you know, they've been placing, you know, winning tournaments for like seven years. How come, you know, when I want to talk to them, you know, they can, they sometimes shrug me off or, you know, especially me. Like when I'm in a tournament, I can be like 50% chance, the really nice guy or a complete fucking dick. Like no questions asked. I'm like, if I'm in a tournament, depending on where I am in the bracket or how focused I am. I can be a pretty monstrous of a person. But it's not because I feel like I have the right to do so, but simply because I'm really, really, really focused on winning the event. And winning is like more important to me than anything else. Um, so you can define it in a lot of ways. And I know I've sort of been rambling on. I didn't like write anything while I was going on. I just simply recorded it. But um, top player privilege is a term that it gets used a lot, but it wasn't something created by top players. It was rather a mold that top players were fitted into to benefit the overall community.
And, you know, whether or not you agree with that, you know, everyone has a right to their opinion and stance. But, you know, but in my stance, you know, being in that top player position, I understand where it's coming from and I understand why it's there. And I think a lot of times it helps the community rather than deteriorates it. So, yeah.